collapse of cod, the loss of cod, represents the greatest loss of a vertebrate in Canadian history. We tend not to view it that way. In fact, nobody communicates it that way, but that's what it is. <coughs> I can tell you it's a loss of about 2, 2.2 billion fish, but that won't mean a lot. Once you get into billions, it doesn't mean much. But if I told you that the total loss of cod is equal by weight to 27 million humans, that might put it into some context to give, to give you a feeling of not only the biological <laughs> loss, the ecosystem loss, but also from a socioeconomic perspective, that's a source of protein, it's a source of income for many people. And when the fishery closed, 40,000 people went out of work overnight. So that had a big impact for someone like me working at DFO and thinking about how government science is related to society. Uh, and at the time, I saw some things happening that weren't quite, uh, I thought, appropriate. Uh, for example, I saw government spokespersons talking about the reasons for the collapse of the cod fishery that were not consistent with scientific advice. I was directly involved with doing scientific research, and I've since published it along with uh, my late colleague, Ransom Myers. We did a lot of work on this, and so did some others. But what government spokespersons were saying is that cod collapsed because of seals, strange water temperatures, uh, other things. Instead of, we simply took too many fish. And one of the reasons for saying that is to make the point that what is happening today is not new. It's happened both with conservative and liberal governments at the federal level. Uh, what I will say is some of the control that is taking place today, in fact, much of the control, though, is, that is taking place today uh, was not foreseen back in the 1990s. When I was at DFO, if a journalist contacted me, and they did, my first interview was with CBC Radio in 1994, uh, can you come down to the studio? Within two hours, you could be there. You didn't need approval. You didn't have to pass media lines by anybody. You just went. In fact, you were supposed to fill out a half-page form afterwards telling people what you did, but most of, most of us ignored that. Um, it's very different today. If a journalist contacts a government scientist, uh, you must submit the questions beforehand. The minister's office must approve the questions. Um, and Typically, the scientist must uh, provide the answers to the minister so that the communications officer can determine whether the answers that the scientist is going to provide is appropriate or not. This, sounds, this might sound odd, but there are multiple examples of this uh, happening today. So uh, what might be a good form of scientific advice? Uh, what kinds of models might I think of? I chaired a the National Science Advisory Committee on Species at Risk for four years. It's called COSIWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And it's responsible for advising the Federal Minister of the Environment which species should be included on the species at risk in Canada, which species are endangered, what are threatened. And then it's up to the federal government to decide, okay, here's what the scientists say, but we'll decide whether we're going to list it or not. Because if you list a species, it might mean restrictions on the ability of individuals or companies to kill species or harm them or their habitat. So it's up to the politicians to decide whether to list a species, but the advice to do so is provided by an arm's length scientific body, arm's length from government, completely. When this body advises the federal government, it advises the government at the same time that it tells the public what the advice is. So there's no opportunity for filtering the advice in any form. Government gets at the same time you get it. And um, lastly, the advice is based only on science, not on socioeconomics, not on political considerations, not on management considerations, only on the science. And the great thing about that model, to my mind, is that it allows society to judge what politicians do. I think politicians should be making the final decision, personally, as to whether to list a species or not. They're the elected officials, not us. But I think, as a citizen of the country, I want to know what the scientific advice was and I don't want it filtered through some political machinery. Uh, another thing that comes to mind with respect to science and why it's important to think about how it's communicated has to do with peer review. Um, science, as a, as a practicing scientist, when we want to publish something, we have to go through a peer review process. So our manuscripts are literally torn apart often by reviewers and often they're rejected because the science isn't worth it, there are problems with methodology, people think you're speculative, and that's fine. That's part of the pros and cons, the to and fro of, of 
of gaining knowledge, basically. So if you interfere with the communication of science, though, you are interfering with science, because science is communication. You take that part out of the, out of the, out of the equation, and you are affecting science, full stop. Now, one of the problems that can arise is when government makes decisions that appear to be based on science, but in fact are not. And if you don't know what the science is, how do you know whether they're being truthful or not? Let me give one quick example. Uh, as I said before, I, I chaired a scientific body, and one of the uh, recommendations of this body was to recommend that cod be in, included as an endangered species on Canada's national list of species at risk. And the uh, minister of the day, a liberal, Jeff Reagan, uh, minister of fisheries and oceans, said, we're not going to list cod because if we listed cod, uh, rural schools would be closed. There would be a cascading effect on the economy. It would cost $82 million a year, and we would have to close every fishery that caught cod either directly or by accident. In other words, what we call bycatch. So this sounded really horrible. Um, and as a member of society, uh, you know, why would you list cod if all this catastrophe was going to happen? But then if you ask the question, well, what was the scientific basis of the minister's decision to close all fisheries and cost $82 million a year, Find out from DFO scientists, and I can give you the documents that are on the web, uh, that indicate that, in fact, uh, from their opinion, bycatch fisheries for cod would not need to be closed. Yes, you'd have to shut down the targeted cod fishery, but you wouldn't have to shut down every other fishery, but that was the message that the minister communicated. That strikes me as being rather inappropriate. And at least at a minimum, be honest about what the science is and what it isn't. I'm not sure that he actually knew, but his advisors did know. And that's actually another issue that comes into play is uh, scientists are expected to adhere to uh, an ethics code. Civil servants, I should say. All civil servants have to, have to adhere to an ethics code, values and ethics code, and you can look at it on the web. And one of those uh, key elements is that civil servants are expected to loyally follow the leaders of the day and their decisions, as opposed to thinking about their accountability to Parliament and to society. And what this has ultimately led to are situations and feelings that are shared by a lot of Canadians as well, that, you know, scientists shouldn't have a right to, to speak <coughs> about their work in an unfettered way. Uh, it should be up to the Minister. Uh, because they're part of a big parliamentary process and government process. But the thing is, is what you might not realize is that, first of all, between the scientist and the minister, there's many layers. Deputy minister, assistant deputy minister, associate assistant deputy minister, director general, manager, director, and then scientist. But it's actually not the minister that's key. It's the staffers in the ministerial office. Unless you've got a very strong minister who really knows his or her portfolio extremely well, then it's the staff in the minister's office who are ultimately making, they're the gatekeepers in many instances. And I could identify a couple departments that are currently like this, but I, I'm not going to uh, name them. Um, but suffice to say that as members of the public, do we know who those people are? Do you know who the staffers are in the minister's offices? Do you know, and even if you look their names up on the web, would you know what their backgrounds are? What's their experience? What are their qualifications? And yet, at the end of the day, you might be surprised and a little taken aback to know how much influence these non-elected, essentially unknown individuals have on day-to-day -day decision making as gatekeepers of the communication of knowledge, including science. Uh, and I'm not going to say much more. Um, I'll give one last example of how science can be misused, and that has to, I'll go back to the cod fishery, because it's something that really strikes at the heart of things. It's, it's the cod fisheries, the collapse of the cod fishery, that really um, was a really good example of what happens when you put economic development first and foremost. When, when, that's, when that's the one thing that matters, and everything else does not matter. And what happens? What happened then? 30 to 40,000 people put out of work. Three to four billion dollars in social aid to Newfoundlanders. Ten percent of Newfoundland emigrated within a decade. Um, this was a huge socio-economic and biological loss. Well, what did science say at the time? In 1992, John Crosby, the minister of the day, predicted, on behalf of Fisheries and Oceans, that the cod would rebound within two years. And the basis for that was a, a graph. There was actually a graph in the press release. You don't see that very often. And 
if you ask the question from a scientific basis, and I ask this question of my third year students every year, I say, of course, as a scientist, as an ecologist, you'd ask the question, what rate of growth is required for the cod to bounce back in two years to a level that hasn't been seen in 20 years? Well, it turns out that the percentage rate of growth far exceeded the best available scientific information. So again, here we had scientific, science-based decision that had huge socioeconomic import. If you're, if you're a fisherman, you're sitting there listening, ah, oh, the fisher will be back in two years. Um, what a sin. I mean, that, that wasn't the case at all. It was a decision given the appearance of science that was not based on science. That was not even subjected to any peer review by scientists within the department. And lastly, the Fisheries Act changes. I don't know how many of you are followed what happened last year. In 1976, the Fisheries Act protected the habitat of all fish. As a developer, you could not undertake projects that destroyed the habitat of fish. And of course, if you protect the habitat of fish, you're protecting the habitat of many other things that live in the water. Plants, birds that use it, reptiles, amphibians, and so on. Now, what has happened is that instead, you cannot do serious harm, and there's a question as to what that means, to a fish that is part of a fishery, commercial, aboriginal, or recreational fishery. What that means, if the minister had sought scientific advice, he would have been told that that means about 80% of Canada's species of fish will not be covered by the Act anymore. It actually means that non-native fishes can be covered by the Act, uh, whereas native fishes cannot. We've got Pacific salmon in the Great Lakes. They're fish that are part of the fishery. We've got brown trout throughout Canada. They're native to uh, Europe. They're not native to Canada. So in fact, in Ontario, there's actually an interspecific hybrid, uh, something called the splake. It's a mix between a lake trout and a brook trout, or a speckled trout, and you interbreed them, and you produce this thing called a splake. They cannot breed on their own. They were produced in the 1960s to combat the sea lamprey coming into the Great Lakes, but they're still produced today and they're stocked into uh, lakes in Ontario. That splate could be protected under the Act, but minnows would not be. So anyway, it's, it's a very recent example of what happens when you don't incorporate science. And lastly, I guess the thing that kind of gets to me as an individual is when you think about who we are as a society and where we have come over the last number of decades and ask the question whether the muzzling, whether the inappropriate uh, guards, filters that are on the communication of science really reflects who we are as a society. I don't think it reflects who I am as an individual. I, I guess collectively that's something we all need to decide upon. But the controls that have been put in place in the last six or seven years have existed to some extent in the past, but never quite to the, to the extent that they, that they do today. And another reason why it should matter to a Canadian is that we have the longest coastline in the world, we have the second largest country by land mass in the world, we have one uh, third of the boreal forests in the world, we have one fifth of the fresh water in the world. We are international stewards of a vast mass of the world's environment and we should be judged as such, and viewed as such. And it's not clear, in my own uh, view, that uh, we're up to the task of it. And we should be perhaps called on that. And so, in closing then, if, if in terms of an action, uh, I know you've probably uh, been told many times that, you know, write your MP, and, or contact your MP, and that actually is incredibly important. And if you want to give a single uh, uh, solution, my, the one I, I fall back on now is to uh, re-establish the Office of Chief Scientific Advisor to the Prime Minister. One of the first things that Prime Minister Harper did in, uh, when they came into power back in 2007, I believe, was to get rid of that office. Every other Western democracy has an office of Chief Scientific uh, Officer. Uh, Chief Scientific Advisor. Uh, in the UK, these are incredibly top scientists. They're Nobel Prize winners in the US. In Canada, we don't have a scientific advisor to the head of government. And I think that says a lot. And I think if we did reestablish that, it would symbolically identify uh, a role for science in society, and I think make some of these other problems that I've touched upon uh, a little bit easier to deal with. So with that.